Guys, um, I am very glad to um, bring Frida all the way from Australia to um, this stream today. She has a powerful testimony and um, Frida actually uh, found out recently when I posted a video of her testimony that I actually mentioned her testimony in my book, Break Free. Um, so in my Break Free book, I mentioned about forgiveness and I watched her testimony first time on Sid Roth where a person was mentioning somebody that they ministered to who had this very tragic past and through the power of forgiveness they were able to forgive and so I kind of researched that name and then when I read that story it was really impactful and, um, and so she's all the way from Australia. Uh, right now she's in Australia. Um, she uh, oversees or mother seven children. She's very busy with work. Um, she has a bachelor's degree that she received here from the United States. She's an author, she's a blogger, she's a speaker. She spoke even at the UN um, speaking about her experience and she has a book called Chosen to Die, Destined to Free, Destined to Live. Um, so Frida, welcome and I'm so glad that you were able to wake up very early. It's like three in the morning from Australia and join it, us today for this live stream. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so, um, Frida, let, let's start from the beginning. For those people who don't know uh, your story, uh, take us to the beginning of how everything um, started with you. Um, your earliest uh, memories and the, the tragic day when you witnessed the brutal killing of your family. Yeah, thank you so much for um, asking me that question and having me on the show. Um, so, at the beginning of war, well, I was born in Rwanda, which is a small country in, in, in East Africa. I had some people that joined from Tanzania and from Kenya, which is the neighboring countries. And some of you who probably have not heard about what happened to my country or my people of Tutsis of Rwanda. In 1994, we had a genocide uh, against the Tutsis um, that wiped out more than a million Tutsis within just three months. So I lost my five, my four siblings. My one sibling had already been killed, uh, which I'll come back to. And I lost my both parents, my grandparents on both sides, and a lot of my um, community and extended family on, you know, within um, just a few weeks. But my whole, my extended family and my immediate family was all killed on the 7th of May. So what had happened was that we, uh, as Tutsis, we had gone through a lot of um, um, discrimination for years and years. And there was a first killing that had happened in 1959, 1962, and a little bit after that. And that had led a lot of Tutsis to leave the country and flee the country and go live in exile. Um, so to cut a very long story short, in 1990, those Tutsis who were living in exile were seeking to come back home. Mm -hmm. And that led to um, uh, the government that was on, which was a Hutu government, to plan a genocide. Now, first memory, as you asked, um, as a little kid, I remember playing in my um, in my village and playing with all you know, kids. My parents never said, you know, you can't play with these children because they are Hutu as well as no extermination between us in the village. In, in fact, my family um, had been really, really um, kind to all the neighbors and so on. My, gran my grandfather, who was a retired teacher, um, had taught us, as, you know, we grew up in a Christian home where we were taught to love everyone. But um, if you talk about the memories that I had, was good memories playing and I was a sporty kid. Um, but then I discovered that I was a Tutsi when I started school because even though your parents didn't tell you that you were a Tutsi, mm -hmm. the school taught you that because, you know, they would come in the class and they would divide us from the age of when I was six. That's when I discovered that I was a, I was a Tutsi. So all those years we had lived under oppression, mm -hmm. under discrimination. Tutsis were not allowed for certain jobs. Tutsis were not allowed certain schools. There was a lot of privileges that we were, we were really like outsiders. Mm -hmm. So when the genocide was then prepared in 1990. We already knew that something was cooking, but nobody could wrap their minds about a genocide happening and wipe out a mil more than a million people within just 100 days. And wow. so uh, maybe I'll come back to on the day when my family was attacked mm -hmm. that morning. How, how, um, how, old were and you? how old were you? So pretty much you grew up with this. There was a prejudice. You were, um, as a child, you know, we were not, as children, we're not taught 
um, you know, we, we don't know the difference between even colors, black, white, you know, children, they play together. It's later on that people begin yes. to enforce you know, racism, prejudice, and all of this stuff. And so, and at the age of six, you already started to see that, that you were a Tutsu, which is supposedly, you're not supposed to be welcomed and you're separated in school. Um, when yes. did you witness, how old were you when you witnessed that 100 day genocide that wiped out 1 million of uh, Tutsu? Tutsis. Yeah, I was 14 years old, I had you just 14. turned 14. Yes. Oh wow. Uh, just just a few weeks after my my fourteenth birthday. Uh -huh. So take us on that day um, when you witnessed that that genocide. I mean, did you was was those a hundred days you lived in fear, um, and how did that come to your village and to your neighborhood? Yeah. So what had happened all the four years? Uh, there was a, a a radio. Papa sleeps that started to plant hatred, and you could hear your name, your children's name, re read over the radio that you are on the list of the people that are supposed to die. And we'd also heard that there was machetes that had been supplied in the neighborhoods. And in, so the government was planning this, you know, clearly and really supporting the communities to do this. And when the uh, president who was a Hutu president was assassinated on the 6th of April. Then it was announced over the radio that the killing is now officially starting. But like I said, there had been a lot of few killings and a lot of uh, tension in the country that my sister was killed a few months before that. But, and my, my dad was also attacked a few, and a few of the men, my dad had also been put in, in jail. But then on that day when the president was assassinated, then he was blamed on the Tutsis and as an excuse to start now officially the killings. So we left our homes because homes were being demolished and burnt and people started running away. And, you know, the killing was now officially starting in all the neighborhoods and put roadblocks everywhere and started attacking Tutsis wherever they were. They were hunting them. So my family left um, two weeks or three weeks after that because in my village didn't start right away mm -hmm. because being that in my village was a bit far off, um, it was considered that the Hutus in my area were good Hutus, that people believed people, uh, Hutus are not going to attack us. So we didn't leave home right away. In mm -hmm. fact, a lot of other Tutsis started coming in our area. Mm -hmm. But then when we started in our area, we ran away from home. My mom said, we're not going to go together because if we all go together in the same place, we're going to be killed all of, and there will be no survivor. So my mom made a plan of dividing us and she sent me and my sister away to our neighbor. So, and then she already, went away. Your sister already, one sister was already killed? Yes. So my youngest sister was killed as a baby in the hospital already. In the hospital? In the, in the hospital. And there was nothing you could report because there was nowhere you could report any anything like that. Oh, wow. We weren't allowed to report any deaths at all. Oh, wow. And, and, and um, your dad goes to jail because of um, he didn't commit any crime. It was just because of that prejudice. Prejudice, and he was accused of being a businessman that he was supporting in the uh, army that was trying to stop the genocide. Oh, and goodness. so they would put Tutsi men in the in jail and sometimes mm -hmm. kill them and sometimes mm -hmm. release them, but he keep an eye on them. So my dad was one of the people that was let go but mm -hmm. he, he wasn't allowed to do his business anymore his movements were very controlled he couldn't leave home if he didn't ask for the permission from the authorities that's crazy um, so the Hutu president yeah. gets assassinated and they blame all of that on the on your tribe uh, really on, on yes uh, and then that pretty much becomes the launch of the genocide. The pretty much a slaughter yes. of where you said machetes, machetes were supplied, and there was an organized yes. government wiping yes. of a of yes. a tribe. Yes. So really, what a genocide is, it's not a one event thing. You know, if you look at the definition of it, it's it's prepared, it's pre prepared and premeditated for a long time, and the propaganda, the brainwash the preparation, the discrimination, all those stages, uh, 10 of them, it's, it takes a very long time for them mm -hmm. to get to a point where they, because the genocide is to kill with an intent to wipe out one group of people. So they really take their time to prepare that. Mm -hmm. um, so so the, when so the we genocide then, is about to come. Your mom 
realizing that if we if you guys all go and escape as a family there's a chance the whole family might be wiped out so you're she's separating yes. the family you and your sister um and yes. then other people to go with to some other place yes so my mom went with my three brothers so i had three brothers and at that point i had one sister left and my three brothers so my mom goes with my brothers and then i go with bless you go with my sister and my cousin and my dad goes with other men um so when we go to my neighbor's house he says no i don't want because people had completely turned their backs on us so he says no i don't want you here and i said but my mom said we should come here and she's gonna come pick us up the next day but he said to, to me but you don't even know if your mom is gonna be alive tomorrow so because he knew wow. he'd been part of the meetings uh -huh. So he let us stay the night, and then the following day, obviously, the killing was getting, uh, you know, bigger and bigger. And mm -hmm. every hundred meters, there was now a roadblock. A roadblock is where they would block roads, and they would bring Tutsis on that roadblock as a killing center, and they'll kill people there. They'll rape women there. They will, if you got captured in the in the in the bush, they'll bring you to that roadblock, and they will celebrate and kill you there. So. On that following day, when he told us to leave, then we went and joined other Tutsis that were in the neighborhood, but really no, no, no support or nothing, just running around, running away from the killers. And there I was able to see my grandma and my brothers on that in that group. We were probably 100 and or more Tutsis together. Mm -hmm. And then we got attacked. When we got attacked, we all ran different directions. So I was able to escape that day with my grandma my sister and my aunties, and then trying to go back home to go thinking maybe we should just run and go back to our, our home. But my home was already demolished. And when we got to my neighbor, asked him to hide us, he hid us for a few hours. Mm -hmm. And then they suspected that we were there. He told us to leave because as a Hutu, if you got discovered that you were hiding a Tutsi, mm -hmm. you would be killed as well because then you were considered a traitor. Mm -hmm. And so he told us to leave. So really went on like that, moving from one place to another for a month. And then in May, they announced that the killing had stopped. But it wasn't true. It was a lie. They would say that so that all the Tutsis that had survived that month could be out of their hidings and then they'll kill them oh easily. Goodness. So we came out of oh. the hiding uh, from the neighbor. We went home. Well, there was no home to go back to. So we went to my grandpa's house. My grandpa was still alive at that point, uh -huh. but it was partially demolished as well. And we were only there for a week. And then um, after a week, that's when my family was attacked. On the morning of the 7th of May, my morning, my family was attacked. At that point, my mom had come back. My dad had come back. My grandparents were there. So we ended up being 18 people in the same home. And we'd been there for, for a week with no food, nothing. That morning, like actually a time like this, three, four o'clock in the morning, we had the neighbors screaming, yelling. But they'd already warned us the day before. The young man who was on the meeting that had already decided that they, they were going to kill us, one of the guys came and told us because he was on the soccer team that my dad had started. Mm -hmm. He wanted to warn us, but my grandfather said, there's nothing we can do. We're going to stay here and die together. We've been running around for so long and there's no sign that this genocide is going to finish, so we're going to stick together and die together. Wow. So when they finished killing the neighbors, then the, uh, the next turn was ours, and they came. The young men that came in the room where we were hiding, we were all hiding, praying, sitting on the floor praying. And um, the young man comes in and looks at us, and we're all hiding with fear. And the young man that I knew very well had a machete in his. So they were killing with machetes, clubs, and spears, and, you know, big, big sticks, but no guns. In my village, to be shot, because we were referred to as snakes and cockroaches. So in my village, to be shot, that was a better death. That's an expensive death. You had to pay. Oh, we had no money. We had nothing left. And oh, so this young man comes and sees us, and then, he gets out and says to them, they're not here. They run away. I think he just wanted to save us. But mm -hmm. the guy that was leading a group, he didn't believe him. So he came in and he saw us and then he got us out. And we were led to the ditch where we were supposed to be killed from. At that point, my father was hiding on the roof where he could actually see and hear what was going on. But he didn't come down. 
So we were led to the ditch where we're supposed to be killed from. But before we got there, my grandfather, a godly man, he said to them, can you give us a time to pray? So we knelt down and started praying. But they used to say the Tutsis have no, they used to use this, uh, you know, this sentence of Tutsis have no God. Because if you had a God, he would save you. So he said, even Tutsis, are, that God has, a, God has abandoned you. Wow. So they didn't, fin- they didn't let us finish our prayer. So they let us, got us up and we were led to that ditch. Now, the worst part is that you weren't killed by somebody you didn't know. You were killed by a neighbor or somebody that you was the, that is a, a co-worker, some people that we knew very well. And my grandfather tried to tell them um, to let us go, but they wouldn't let us go. So we were then told to lay down because in, a, in Rwanda, April, May, and June is a rain season. So that was a rain season. And so the, the ditch was muddy. We were then told to go in that ditch and lay on our stomachs. But then they said, okay, we're giving you a chance to, you can choose whatever you're going to be, each one can choose whichever you're going to be killed with. And for me, I picked a young man that I knew very well. He had a club and I asked him to kill me with a club because so I knew wait, with a so, club so there would be if- you knew the people that were killing you? Yes. So you, were neighbors. you went to your neighbors, you went and then pretty much your only option was you, you can only choose with what you can be killed with. You There was yes. no way to to avoid being killed um and no oh my goodness there was no way to avoid there was no um there was no even letting the innocent little kids you know talk about maybe mm-hmm. even if the adults yes maybe you may have before whatever but there's not even leaving the pregnant women or little babies there was no mercy whatsoever and because again remember the intent is to wipe out everyone so that no survivor they mm-hmm. even used to say we need to kill the twist to a point that is not even a survivor to tell the story which is mm-hmm. why um you know when um, i say my book title mm-hmm. is uh, called chosen to die mm-hmm. destined to leave if, if you and could, if we before we go into what happened that day what was the yes. religion of the hutu man or the hutu what was the religion well, i mean i understand their prejudice but what i mean i, I know it's demonic but what, what was the religious yes. conviction? So really, Rwanda is considered a Christian country. So it, it had nothing to do with religion really? or whether that, the, because the, some you'll be surprised that some of the people that were in that same group, the man who got us out was a pastor. He was he was a Christian. He was a pastor. And but the belief behind it, they even used, they, they, they twisted the scriptures of saying, you know, uh, the snake will bite the heel of a of, of mm-hmm. a son of a man, mm-hmm. and, and so and and, and will crush the the the, mm-hmm. the son of man will crush its head. Mm-hmm. That scripture they twisted completely to make it sound like they were doing the right thing to be killing, crushing our heads. That we were the remember we were we were referred to as snakes. So, so really, to Tutsu were the snakes, the cockroaches, and they needed yes. to be crushed and the Hutu men were pretty much the ones that to do the crushing. Yes. So really we were considered enemies from the very beginning. And, and like I said to you, that was part of the propaganda of now dehumanizing us, that mm-hmm. we were less than human being. And so if the communities and the Hutus are, are doing That's the killings, crazy. they're actually doing a good thing. Oh my God. So that is demonic, as you're saying. Uh-huh. So, and, so um, in, that, in that little ditch, it's raining. There's about, you said it was about 18 or 14 of your family members? So at that point, during when we got to the ditch, we were now 16 people left. 16. So there was 18 people in the room, but one of the ladies, which was my mom's friend, she tried to run away and they ran after her and killed her. The other girl was my mom's cousin and she had a baby. So if the father of a child was a Hutu, then that child was considered to be a Hutu. So she lied to them and said to them, this child, this is my sister's baby. And her dad is a Hutu. Can you allow me to take the baby? And then you can do whatever you want afterwards. So they let her go. And so that was 16 people left. So that was myself, my grandparents, my four siblings, my mom. My mom had two boys of her friend and um, my, my four aunties and, and two cousins. So all the 16 people in the ditch, in the same ditch. And now at that point, uh, when I picked the young man to... Uh, kill me with a club 
it's because I know, I said to him, I don't want to be killed with a machete because I know with the machete they will cut you in pieces. So I thought a club was a bit better <laughs> as a child, really thinking like a child. And um, so th- as we are all picking, and my mom said, no, I'm not picking anything. It's all death anyways. And the one guy jumps in the ditch and hits my grandpa. But my grandpa, before he was hit, he told them, why are you doing this to us? Jesus Christ taught us to love each other, and we have been kind to you. But we, before he finished what he was saying, the one guy jumped in the ditch and hit him with a club, and my grandpa fell forward. And that's when they all jumped in that ditch and started hitting. So the one image that tormented me for years, even as a teenager, my mom's, I saw my mom's head being chopped off, and that's when I covered my head with a hoodie that I had, and this young man that I had picked hit me at the back of my head. I don't know if he hit me more than once, but the one time that he hit, I lost consciousness. And he hit on my neck instead of my head. Mm-hmm. And um, I lost consciousness. I don't know how long I was unconscious for, but when I woke up, they were now barring, covering the ditch, and they were stepping on us. So obviously, people had already died, and my sister was the only one that was still breathing a little bit and I thought to myself if I speak they're going to pull me aside and pull me in a a really bad way so I kept quiet thinking after they leave maybe I could shake myself and come out and so they covered the grave completely closed the grave and left and then another thought was maybe my dad will see what happened maybe I'll scream and he will hear me but my father being that he was the man that I was seeing his wife and children and parents and you know the whole family killed he actually came after they killed as he came down by the time they finished barring he was waiting for them to go kill him as well so he offered himself he gave himself in so now i'm in that grave and my sister tried to call my sister i could call her and it was me 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 and i was trying to make her stay up but she passed away just a few minutes after that so, you, you, so very you, were, you were buried alive. Yes. You were buried alive. I was under, buried. Under dirt. Under dirt. With your family. Between 15 dead bodies. And you, blood. Were, you were 14 years of age? Yes. I was only 14. Oh, wow. So and, um, wow. yeah, stayed in there and I prayed. Now, like I said, I was raised Christian and I prayed in that grave. And I remember praying and saying, Lord, if you ever take me out of this grave, please save me. If you ever take me out of this grave, I'll serve you all the days of my life. You know, those prayers that we all pray when we get Mm -hmm. in situations where you see no life whatsoever. And I cried and prayed at the same time. So for hours and hours, and I got to a point where I couldn't even move because the more I tried to move, the more the soil covered even where I was breathing from. Now there's blood everywhere, there's mud, and it's just becoming really cold. And um, good enough, a lady that was in that area picking bananas, she heard my voice, and she thought there's a ghost. So she, for her, she thought it was a ghost because she, she, she couldn't hear what exactly it was and where the voice was coming from, and she couldn't understand why the voice would be coming from the ground. But it was me crying and praying. And so she came closer and then she heard my voice and ran. And she went and told one of the young men and she said, there's a ghost in that place where they buried people since morning. And this ghost is not stopping. It's been screaming under the ground. So the young man who used to work for my grandfather said, no, that might be someone buried alive. So he came. And he came with his friend and he's the one that, you know, decided to try dig and try to see who it was. And he got me, got me out. But then as soon as he got me out of that ditch, then there was another group coming, running, screaming, yelling. And, you know, they were attacking again. And he said, oh, if they can know, if they know that I've tried to save you, they're going to kill me. So he left and said, you can't tell them that I, I helped you. I said, don't worry, I won't. But as he leaves and I'm sitting there, then I hear another group that just finished killing my my dad. So now I know everyone is dead. I know that even my dad didn't run away. I know that my dad is also killed. So this group comes and looks at me and 
you know, really, I looked, I looked like a gossip. You, well, looked worse and, and um, blood and mad and everything. So the only thing I did was to actually just take mad off my eyes and my mouth. And so when they saw me, was, what what are you? Where did you come from? I said, I just came from that grave. And they said, who took you out? I said, took out, I came out myself. And I said, this is this is what, you know, the ghosts look like. These are ghosts, Tutsi ghosts are starting to, you know, to, um, to torment us. This is not human. It's not a human being. So they left me. They didn't even kill me um, because they believed I was a ghost. It really looked bad. Oh and um, later on, after they left, this old woman who had called the young man who served me, um, she then took me in for a few hours. And then um, and then she was suspected that she had me in, in there because now, the news got around that, you know, from one person to another that I came out of the grave. So the news got around that there was someone that came out of the grave. So now all the killers knew that I had come out. And a few other people also had survived like that in my in my village, mm-hmm. come out of either the ditches, the toilets and stuff like that. So now they um, said to, to me that nobody's going to kill me. They're just going to leave me there with no food, no no water. And let me die there. And um, I was then hidden and taken in by another man who was a, a Hutu, and he took me for for weeks. This one he took me in for weeks until the genocide was over. He decided to hide me until the genocide was over and saved my life. So during the day, what he used to do during the days that he would let me sleep, stay in the house because during the day they will not search in the houses. But during the night, they were searching homes to see who, who, which Hutu is hiding at Tusi. And then he dug a small ditch in his banana plantation outside. And that's where I would spend my nights for weeks until the genocide was over. So the genocide didn't stop in my village until um, uh, last week of, probably last week of June. So I had been hiding for all of those weeks until the genocide was over. And then I was taken to a safe place of where um, the Tutsi um, and the Hutu who did not agree with what was going on, obviously a small, a small percentage of the Hutus had joined in with the fighting to stop the genocide. And they took me then to a place where they were putting all the, all the survivors. And that is when it hit you. Because all those three months as a kid, mm-hmm. but even as an adult, I think as a kid, you hoped this was a nightmare and that you will actually wake up, wake up out of this nightmare. That's I kept telling myself, this is not happening. This is a nightmare. It's not happening. It's, there's no way that I'm, you know, I've lost every. But on that day when I was taken to a safe place where the survivors were, mm-hmm. that was the day I realized this is not just a nightmare. It actually is real. My entire family is gone. Wow. You've met other survivors, some of them very much wounded, worse than you were. Mm-hmm. Met a lot of other orphans that came in that place and were t- brought in that place. We were hopeless. All of us were hopeless. You looked at the life that we were just there, even though we had survived. Life had no shape whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And that was the first day that I sat down and cried as a kid. I sat on the side of the road and cried uncontrollably i couldn't like i I, that was the day that i let everything hit me and believe that it actually you know i survived this but i survived alone Mm -hmm. and um um so from then then you joined a lot of other you got to know who survived from this family and that family and i got to know that a few of my extended families few extended cousins had survived and then start searching where 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 do I go from here? Mm-hmm. So at that point, the RPF, which is the Rwanda Patriotic Army that stopped the genocide, was looking after us, and they will um, join you with some of your um, survived um, um, members of the family. Mm-hmm. They will re- help you to rejoin them, but it was a tough moment. It was a tough time. So your immediate family was completely wiped out by genocide. Wiped out. Yes. You're 14 so, years of age. You're going through this these 100 days, and you're thinking it's a nightmare. You're gonna wake up out of it, and then you 
you know, when you came out of the grave, um, the only reason they didn't kill you is because uh, they thought you were a ghost. They didn't think you yes. were actually a real human being. And yes. the, then the Hutu men, you know, um, hid you in his house and um, and actually dug a hole for you to hide in while yeah. the genocide was still going on. And then yes. when you finally escape to a safe place, then the, you realize it's not a nightmare. This is a reality that you've been going through and pretty much, you know, all that real, real suffering now started to take, yes. you know, deeper roots and you started to get, you know, reunited to your more of extended family, any anyone who was still left. Um, how, what happened to that? How did that start to affect your life down the road? And um, did you escape to Europe afterwards? No, I didn't escape to Europe afterwards. So I got to know, because uh, my mom had a brother who was in Burundi, which was the neighboring country. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, she actually had two brothers and one was in the army. And okay. they got to know that I had survived. So my mom's brother came and picked me up and mm -hmm. I lived with him for a bit in Burundi. But I was pretty traumatized kid. I was had nightmares every single night, didn't sleep. During the day, I, could, I couldn't sit still. I was crying all the time. You know, I didn't eat. I started developing stomach ulcers. I started developing you know, headaches and migraines and really crying all the time. He didn't know what to do. He was, you know, he was only a young man at that point. So he decides, I'm going to get this kid out of here. I can't, because he was going back home to Rwanda because now Rwanda was peaceful. People were returning from exile. But he said, I can't take her back to Rwanda. So he sent me off to his cousin who were living in West Africa in the country called Gabon. Okay. And he thought at that point, maybe her going away from Rwanda, it will help her. But when I got there, it got even worse. Because not only the kids in my school got to know the news that, you know, I had survived this. Now it became the talk of the whole school. So kids will come and make fun of me during the break. So because they, you know, I mean, now in the country where children don't even understand. So they will come and make fun of me say, oh, she's a ghost, and they will touch me, and they will, oh, wow. are you really a human? Are you really, you know, so now it becomes even worse. Not only am I suffering my own traumas of losing my entire family, but I'm also now bullied at school for being a survivor. So I asked my um, my extended family to take me back home because at least back home I knew I'll go back and I'll live with other survivors mm -hmm. who share my pain. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, I had my cousins that were one of my cousins that was very, very close to me had survived as well. Her name is Adeline and she lives in Canada now. And I thought if only I have Adeline next to me, I'll be OK, because then at least she understands what I'm going through. And that's exactly what I asked them to do for me, to take me back to Rwanda. And we lived in the boarding schools so as survivors. We really were pretty tight together and close together because we understood well each other each each person went through if you cried we all gathered together and took him to comfort you mm -hmm. if you had triggers in in the school because now look in rwanda it's a country where you live side by side with those who killed your family whether you like it or not and so um and the country has done a lot of work um to have you know uh the both sides living together mm -hmm. in the same country but at the same time, that doesn't stop the pain that we were going through as survivors. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. being in the same class, you are taught with a, a Hutu um, that probably participated in the genocide. At that point, there was no um, justice gachacha, which is the local court, mm -hmm. going on yet. Um, so it was hard. And living, going back to the same school, going back with the children who whose parents killed your parents was hard. But... Um, wow. I think because we were we were together, mm -hmm. that's probably the the time the the comfort that we had for each other as survivors. And mm -hmm. and um, and for four years, I was really really traumatized, like crying and depression, and you know stomach ulcers and all those kind of sicknesses that sicknesses that I mentioned mm -hmm. until I was eighteen and I gave my life to Christ. So that that was a turning point for me when I gave my life. To, so like uh, like I said, I was raised Christian. But I was just going to church for the honor of my family. Mm -hmm. I hated 
church at because a lot of churches in Rwanda now are made to be um, memorials because a lot of people were killed in churches in Catholic churches. So I went, I still went to church, but I didn't believe in God. I didn't, I really didn't have faith in God. Mm -hmm. But when I turned 18, that's when I gave my life to Christ. And that was a turning point, completely turn around for me. And that's when I, dis I discovered and under started understanding the purposes of God on my life mm -hmm. and how it's actually the day that I start. How could I have been in that ditch, buried alive for hours and hours, yet God still pre preserved me and was able to come out still. So that's when I started searching has to be a purpose of God on my life. And on that day, on the 15th of January, 1998, the day that I gave my life to Jesus, mm -hmm. that was the day that I started understanding all that. God mm -hmm. has brought me back for a purpose. Mm -hmm. He's brought me back from that ditch mm -hmm. to tell his story and to testify about his, his power. Did it after you gave your life to Christ as, at 18? Um, yes. Did you forgive um, those people? Did it took you a while? And what was, how did your healing process and your yeah. forgiveness process begun? No, right away. <laughs> right away. I became a Christian, but I actually resented anyone that would talk about forgiveness. Really? You know, we had, I used to be part of the Christian fellowship that I would go to every lunch hour fellowship, but I, I resented every, anybody that would talk about forgiveness. I thought to myself, Lord, I'll fast, I'll pray, I'll do whatever you want me to do, but I will never forgive those people. I'll never forgive photos because even if I forgive, I used to give myself reasons. Even if I forgive, there's no way that, my, first of all, they haven't, you know, when it comes to the forgiveness subject, it's a very touchy subject where you think if somebody has not asked you for forgiveness, then you not forgive them. Mm -hmm. But we forget that forgiveness is a gift that you give to yourself. And it's it's a it's it's an act of obedience mm -hmm. towards your God versus what you're doing to the other person. Because those people may never, never humble themselves, mm -hmm. have a heart of humility to come and ask for the forgiveness. So it's not about the perpetrator asking you for forgiveness. It's about you obeying God. But at that point, I didn't understand that. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to just know uh, there's no way because I also felt like if I forgive them, then I'm weak. Mm -hmm. I'm giving them, you know, I'm weak. I'm the one becoming weak. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we also confuse forgiveness and weakness. And if you forgive, I'm letting them off the hook and I'm the weak one. Mm -hmm. But it's not about letting them off the hook. And it's not about minimizing the crime that was done to my people either. Mm -hmm. And so that, I had not understood at that point because I only thought if I forgive them, I'm weak. And so anyone that talked about forgiveness, I felt like every example they gave, either my wife cheated on me, either my somebody killed my dog, not, none of that was compared to my pain. So I thought, no, how do you compare? That's not compared to what I went through, mm -hmm. what my people went through. So for a very long time, I couldn't. And then when... The Lord started dealing with my heart because it got to a point where I would go in church, but if a Hutu came and sat next to me, I would move. That's when I that's wow. when I, I then recognize I actually have a big issue. If I if I can't even sit with this person, I still carrying hatred in my heart. As a Christian, I'm spilled filled, I'm speaking in tongues, but I can't actually even sit next to a Hutu in a church. That means I'm carrying hatred in my. So the Lord started dealing with my own heart first mm -hmm. of healing from hatred, feeling, healing from anger and mm -hmm. bitterness. And the more he dealt with that, then I came to a point of understanding the journey of forgiveness. Because it's really a journey. Mm -hmm. It's not a marathon. It's a journey. And, and then when I started walking that journey, the first time I thought, okay, now I'm ready. I think I've forgiven this. I started actually praying for them. Wow. and feeling pity for them mm -hmm. and and then i thought i'm ready now i can go see them i can't even go face them and i went to jail to meet the man who killed my father because i knew where he was but on the first day when i met him i was overwhelmed with fear anger you know all sorts of feelings mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And I actually sat down and cried. I couldn't shake hands with him. I couldn't even say what I wanted to say to him. Mm -hmm. And he just stood there looking at me like he despised me, which is what I said. It's not about the perpetrator because the perpetrator may still want to hurt you, may still. Mm -hmm. So it's not for them, it's for you. And you didn't but go there because day, he didn't he didn't ask you for forgiveness at first, right? You just didn't. went there to forgive I just went there. To forgive him or you went there to tell him what he did was wrong or what was your reason to go? I went there to forgive him. I went there feeling that, you know, I'm ready now to forgive these people, okay. but my forgiveness is gonna on my level because I'm still living in the same country. Okay. I thought to myself, I'm gonna face on these monsters in my mind mm. i'm gonna face on and take my power back and i'm gonna profess to them that i've forgiven them okay. in order to make sure and to know which i always always say that's not a recommendation from every person mm. who's been abused and survived mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. but i was doing that for me because i knew by doing that i'm taking my powers back mm -hmm. and that when on that day when i went i couldn't even talk to him i just cried and went back home and for months and months for weeks i was crying to god to equip me with grace equip me with the power to be able to do it because i really wanted to do it because i'm gonna see these people whether i like it or not mm -hmm. so i want to be able to see them and not feel the hatred in my heart and not to also be scared to run mm -hmm. um, and so a few weeks later i was able to go back again and then that that was the day that I was able to talk to him. And I said to him, I've come here. I know that you know who I am. He said, no, I don't. And I said, um, Bennett, Bennett is my, my dad. I said, I'm, I'm Bennett's daughter. And obviously I had grown a little mm -hmm. f since then. And I said to him, I know you killed my father. And I know how you killed him as well. I've heard about the whole thing. And I'm not going to ask you to give me the details. On that day, I didn't want to hear the details of how he killed him. But I said to him, but I've come here to forgive you. And I've forgiven you because I'm a Christian. I'm, 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 I'm a Christian now and I, I'm coming here to tell you to, that I've forgiven you. There was no response, no good response from him at all. There was no thank you. There was nothing. Again, that shows you it's not about them. It's about your heart. Mm -hmm. But when I did that and I shook his hand for the first time, mm -hmm. I actually felt like for me, I was now standing in a place where I'm now in my own comfortable and powerful place versus him being a monster over me. And I proceeded to go to the to the village. I went now to my village mm -hmm. where I met a few more people. And I met the woman who was next door, the was next door neighbor. Her sons had come in a group that killed my, my family. Her, her son killed my sister. And I go to her house. She's wearing my mom's dress. She's all the furniture she has in her house, of all our furniture. Oh. And the Lord instructs me, do not mention anything about material things. Tell her that I love her. Tell her about me. Wow. And that's the hardest thing to be able not to mention anything about the dress of your mom that you're looking at, at that she's wearing. But I was able to pray with her and leave. And I say to her, look, I've come here. To tell you about Jesus and to tell you that I've forgiven you and your family. And that that was my turning point. That was the beginning of my healing of from hatred. Wow. Yeah. Did was it long after that you received the healing from the nightmares and everything, all of those things? Or actually from that from that night I went home for the first time. I was able to sleep with no nightmare and and from that day on I went on for weeks. I went on. For, I was able to now start eating, start to be able to um, to be friends with you know with a lot of other people in my school that I, I couldn't be friends with at that point. Mm -hmm. Really, my my heart was delivered. My life was delivered from hatred from then. Uh, and now, like I said, um, obviously, when you've lost a family, that's mm -hmm. not going to take away the fact that you've lost your family, that you've mm -hmm. lost you know, everything that you've ever known as, as a kid and as a teenager mm -hmm. didn't turn out that, you know, now, hey, I'm not an orphan anymore. Um, everything is perfect and I don't have to deal with the pain of, you know, when other children in school, in the boarding school have their visitation, I don't have mine. But every time I came across that, I dealt with it with a heart of, Lord, give me the grace to accept this as well. Mm -hmm. And without having to have that hatred in my heart, 
And to this day, even I, you know, you know, as I'm a mom now, I'm a mother. And just recently we went home, we went back home to Rwanda with my children. And I took them to that very journey that I just described to you. I took them in that room where we were sitting. I took them to the ditch where I was buried alive. I took them everywhere because I've rebuilt also my home. But all that I'm able to even tell my children a story of how I've survived with no hatred in my heart because that's what I want to leave a legacy of their history, of their story, but telling it with a, a hatred, with mm-hmm. a, you know, planting a hate in their hearts mm-hmm. of retaliation. Mm-hmm. And so it doesn't change the fact that you've lost your people and you've lost your family and you're going to miss them. But the fact that you're taking care of your heart each day as a Christian and walking in, in the will of God, in the mm-hmm. walking with God Mm -hmm. and valuing that relationship you have between you to not Mm -hmm. have the hatred hinder Mm -hmm. your prayers. Mm -hmm. Do you have, um, has any of those people that you've forgiven, have they, any of them repented? Any of them came to Christ because of that? Uh, So only one man called me one time and actually not, no, since I was here in Australia, he got my number and called me at one point and he, he asked me for forgiveness. That was one of the men that, um, um, that had destroyed my home. And I didn't even know he came to the group that's destroyed my home, but he said his heart been aching a lot and Mm -hmm. he's been looking forward to be able to talk to me. And he said he was very sorry. And can I forgive him? That was probably the only person that ever asked for forgiveness. Everyone else, it was, you know, none of them ever come and say, I'm sorry for what has happened or, or, you know, Mm -hmm. or even ask for, like we said, like I said, it was more of them, Mm -hmm. even to this day, some of them still have that hatred Mm -hmm. in in their hearts. Mm -hmm. So if you go by what they think or feel, you will never walk your own journey, your own healing journey. Wow. Yeah. You answered a lot of questions that I already had about forgiveness, you know, not to wait for the person to ask for forgiveness. Um, if this, guys, if this is probably the most craziest story of forgiveness you have heard, drop number one in the chat. Go ahead and hit like to this video. Share this with somebody. Um, I know a lot of you, I see a lot of you commenting and saying, you know, I thought my problems were big or I thought, you know, whatever you had to forgive maybe for an absent father or even you know abusive somebody who abused you the and we're not here to say that your trauma and your pain those of you who are listening to this doesn't matter because each one of us you know we don't god doesn't compare our pain to other people's pain you know each one of us pain it hits us in our personal way and it's deep but sometimes hearing a story like this um, it could bring some things in perspective and also it could really bring um just almost like help to snap out of the the false reality or the this 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 emotion of um offense that many people have built to see that if this person can endure that and i think that in your story um frida probably knowing that jesus has forgiven you and what he suffered on the cross you know which was for our sin for your sin for my sin for the sins of humanity and he forgave us um, and that is our motivation to forgive because we've been forgiven and you highlighted so beautifully that you know your relationship with god was struggling uh, because uh, you know that unforgiveness it builds that offense it continues to reinforce nightmares it continues to reinforce even some sicknesses and diseases and when we forgive we don't necessarily forgive for the benefit of those people and i like the fact that you mentioned that none of them uh, repented and so but you didn't forgive it for them you forgave it first of all for christ relationship with you for your own heart to be pure because forgiveness it didn't delete the past it didn't go and rewrite the past but now it gave you a brand new future where you you know somebody can listen to you they will never be able to say that wow you, you don't sound like an offended person. You don't sound like a person who has been a survivor. You sound like a victorious, uh, successful, uh, you know, educated, smart person. Um, you, you don't carry the, the, the wounds. You have the scars now because those wounds were healed through your forgiveness yes. and through the power of Jesus Christ. Um, what would you tell to somebody who, um, how do they receive the healing? How do they walk through the process of forgiveness and healing after 
um, they've realized that the abuse that was done to them, you know, now they have to forgive. Now that they're become a Christians, they have to forgive. Mm -hmm. Could you kind of take yes. them through some of the practical steps? Because, you know, some people say that, you know, you forgive and you forget. You forgive, it shouldn't hurt anymore after that. You should, it should be an instant thing. And for you, there was a process. Could you take somebody through the process or, or give us some of the practical things that we can do to experience mm -hmm. healing as we forgive? Yes, uh, that's a very good question because I think uh, forgiveness is also sometimes taught in a wrong way that uh, people think of oh, forgive, forget. And that's not true. That's Forgiving does not mean you forget um, unless you, you, you go, you know, you don't, you, you, you're not well um, mentally, mm -hmm. but forgiving does not mean that you forget the details because I will never forget that I had a, a mother and I had a father. Um, so first of all, it's to understand what forgiveness isn't and what forgiveness is. Like I said before, forgiveness is not minimizing the crime or the abuse. And forgiveness is also, you need to understand that it's not also not excusing uh, the other person. Or also, it's not also um, that you are weak and they're still powerful. Or it's also not about, forgiveness is also not about, uh, you know, I'm going to forget about all these these things. But it's actually understanding. It's it's an act of obedience towards God as a child of God. It's an act of uh, also imitating God. You know, um, the Bible says in Ephesians 5 uh, verse 1, it says, be imitators um, of God as beloved children. And so it's about imitating God. It's about imitating Jesus Christ who died for us on the cross, who gave his life. And also it's understanding that it's a gift. So really because it's from him, you can never forgive. You cannot be able to forgive in your own strength. So it's about going to God and ask him for that grace, especially when there is an abuser around, still around. If it is a woman who's been beaten by a husband and the husband, even if you've divorced, you still carrying the fear and the and the anger and, and, and all those effects of the abuse and he's still around, he's walking free or someone who's sexually abused you. So really it takes God's grace and God is not cheap in grace. He is full of grace. So when you ask for it, he's going to grace you. And trust me, there's grace for everything. Mm -hmm. I, I used to hear just my say, um, there's grace for every, every stage of your life because if you're not an orphan, you don't need a grace for an orphan. If you're not a widow, you do not need a grace for a widow. But when you become one, there's a grace and there's a grace wow. for that. And his mercy, the Bible says his mercies are new every morning. So each morning, wake up and ask for those mercies and for that grace to help you get to that point. And then the other part that I would say, the other stage is uh, uh, it's not a feeling. Forgiveness is not a feeling. That's good. Because... If you think, oh, I have to feel it before, you know, I have to feel that I've forgiven. No, like I said, it's a journey. It's not a marathon that you run. It's a journey. You may forgive because the truth of God remains the truth of God. And when you remain in, in the word of God, the truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. But the enemy may keep ringing in your ears. No, you haven't forgiven. No, you steal this. Oh, no, you steal that. How come you still you feel that ill feeling well how come you don't visit them it doesn't also mean trust because sometimes mm -hmm. people also uh confuse feel uh, um, uh forgiveness with trust mm -hmm. in my case even when i go to my village like i said i can't uh, to this point i cannot sleep in my own house because the perpetrators are there and something happened in 2009 when i had just had my my youngest child and i was trying to rebuild to to rebuild my home i had i was also trying to to rebury, to give my dad a decent burial, because that's what we do in our culture. Mm -hmm. We pick the remainders and we give them a decent burial. And that helps us as survivors, help us to actually come with in terms with the healing. Mm -hmm. So, but when I was trying to give my dad a decent burial, this man, one of the perpetrators, dug his body out and dumped his body close to my home and kept the, his head somewhere else. And he did that to hurt me. He even says that himself. I say that because I knew you were looking for this so you can come, you know, uh, get the closure of your father's death. So I did that to hurt you. So forgiveness does not mean trust. It doesn't mean you're going to trust the perpetrator and leave it. And sometimes 
it doesn't even mean reconciliation mm. in some cases because in some cases it means you forgive the person you clear your heart but there's no coming back to that relationship mm -hmm. and even the bible talks about in romans 12 it talks about if on your part live at peace with everyone mm -hmm. which means some 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 perpetrators or most cases actually like i said the perpetrators have not come to me and asked for forgiveness so really normally a friendship or a relationship is two ways and so um in some cases it doesn't mean reconciliation but it means humility it means obedience towards your god it means asking him to grace you to to cover you with grace it also means you have wisdom around it the way you approach an abuser or a perpetrator don't be like me i'm gonna go to the jail and meet this person if you're not ready mm -hmm. but it, it requires wisdom of god and where you you, you also maybe it is also important that you either approach either a counselor or pastor mm -hmm. yeah. or a friend to actually ask them to walk that journey with you and to have a check-in with you That's good. but if you wait for the feeling for me i think to this point if i see a hutu or a hutu chado or you know not that we refer to each other like that anymore in rwanda but even if i saw a, a, a killer it, when i go home and i see them I have no hatred for them whatsoever. But mm -hmm. that's because I walked that journey for a long yeah. time. I, I didn't have the feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought I had forgiven. But every time I saw them, I moved, you know. But um, that was a journey for me. Mm -hmm. But do not wait. Believe in the word of God. Believe in what is true and what you've done. And mm -hmm. wait for the feelings to catch up. Because our how feelings... Would you, how would you describe... How did you, How did you know when you truly forgiven them? like how what what was like the test did you stop moving when they show up was it just like not having hate anymore i mean you mentioned that it's not a feeling that means sometimes through the process of healing we can still experience feelings that could come upon us but we stick with our decisions but how would somebody know if they've truly forgiven somebody so for me for me it was the very first time not to mention anything about my, a woman who's wearing my mom's dress that was a big thing you know, a dress could be in your in our eyes, could be something small. But mm -hmm. the fact that my mom had been killed and now this next door woman is wearing her dress, the fact that I didn't mention that and I let her have it without snatching it off her, <laughs> that was the that was a big step for me. The next step was more when I went back to school and I started actually relating to some of the Hutu children now as friends and talk to them, be able to not feel like I want to vomit when they are next to me. That was, again, that for me, you know, I, I've, I've actually, you know, the Lord is, is delivered my heart from hatred, from this monster of, uh, of, um, of hatred. Mm -hmm. And when I started helping people and not just help my own people, but help everyone, like when I went back home and I started rebuilding my home, to me, I would have chosen not to give them a job to build my home because I would have said, you build it because you're the one who destroyed it and I'm not paying you for doing that. Wow. But the fact that I, when I was rebuilding my home, I was able to give them a job to do it and pay them for it. That was, that was for me, I was like, oh my goodness, I don't even believe I'm doing these things. The fact that when I took my children in the village, I was able to let my children play with their children they're next door, they're there. When because when I was still living in Rwanda and I had my my small children, I went to that house every other weekend and I took my children, I let my children run around in the and I let the their children play with my children. And I didn't say my children don't play with them, those are children of of killers. The fact that I so all those little things for me, mm -hmm. the fact that I was able to start praying for them, mm -hmm. pray in my heart for them, for the change not just the change of my own people, but the change of my own country as a whole. So the fact that all those things for me, it, 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 was a, it wasn't some time that I, it wasn't that I waited for the feeling. It was that I believed in what God had done in my heart. Amen. Then I let the feeling catch up. Wow. Frida, I know there's a lot of people that are watching who need to forgive somebody. Some who are yes. facing nightmares some who are facing chronic physical illness that if they will only forgive God will start the healing process and it's not fair 
that they are the ones suffering physically and emotionally when they already have been mistreated and taken advantage of. But you know, the enemy and sin doesn't work by fairness. And um, could you pray for people right now that the Lord will give them the grace and for those that are making a decision to forgive, maybe it's their ex, maybe it's somebody who betrayed them, somebody who cheated on them, maybe somebody who, God forbid, physically, sexually abused them or somebody who maybe went through um, a thing where they lost their family and they're bitter yes. at God maybe, maybe they're bitter at, at other people. Could you kind of lead them into a prayer right now of forgiveness and asking God for mercy so that they could find the same forgiveness you found? Definitely. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this opportunity, Lord. Thank you for this moment. I, though we are all different times uh, where we all are, but we are also in the same time and same moment in your presence, Father. And I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity for um, speaking through your story. It's not my story, but your story. I pray, Father God, for someone who's struggling with forgiveness and struggling with with um, a lot of feelings of hate and bitterness and, and for good reasons of what they have gone through. And I pray, Father God, that you heal their heart. I pray that your healing power will touch them, will touch their hearts. And I pray that you heal their minds and their emotions in the name of Jesus. And that, Lord, through that as well, through that healing that they receive from you, I pray, Father God, that they will extend that same grace, Father God, yes. to others, Father God. But I pray that you fill them with peace, you fill them with courage, fill them with um, with understanding of you, Lord. You said in your word, Father God, that you are full in mercies and you are you you are full of kindness, Father God. And so I I believe that, and I believe that that same kindness can fill a broken heart and can heal a broken heart and can heal pieces in our in in our lives, Father God. And so I pray that you teach us to extend that same grace, Lord, to others, to those around us. But most importantly, Father, I pray for the grace to understand that your healing is available and that your yes. forgiveness is awaiting. And I pray that they understand as well, Lord, that it is not by power, not by might, mm -hmm. but by your Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you enable uh, that person who's mm -hmm. struggling, that you uh, make the hard ways and the hard relationships, Lord, repair, to be repaired in the name mm -hmm. of Jesus. I pray that that grace will mm -hmm. come to effect as well, Lord, in their everyday life, Father God. Mm -hmm. And as they open their hearts mm -hmm. to receive, I pray that they will also open their arms and their hearts to give. Mm -hmm. We give you praise, Father God, and we ask for you. Holy Spirit to keep walking with us and helping us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Wow, uh, Frida, thank you so much. I have felt the presence of Jesus most of the half of the time that you were speaking, uh, you know, goosebumps going through my body because of just, it's, it's, it's both witnessing the horror of human evil, uh, demonic evil and the beauty of God's grace, the love that, you know, I'm thinking, I'm like, only through Christ can somebody be able to forgive. There's no other way. There's no other way somebody will be able to forgive. Um, you have a book. Um, can you tell yes. us a little bit about your book and why you wrote it and what people can expect? And we're going to pin the comment, pin the link in the video below, as well as going to drop it in the chat right now. Everybody should go and get the book. But could you tell us a little bit about your book? Yes, yeah, so I wrote my book because I knew with the book that the Lord talked to me about writing a book and putting my story down that it will bless a lot of people and will be able to reach people that I may not never be able to reach because the book goes to into homes where you will never enter, mm -hmm. countries where you will never travel. And so that's why I wrote the book to testify uh, about God's mercies in my life and also, uh, you know, tell my story of of. Of, of my people. Um, so uh, you can find the book uh, for those who are, um, you know, in America or Europe, you can find the book on Amazon. Mm -hmm. It's called uh, Frida, Chosen to Die, Destined to Live. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, or you can also find, if for those who are in Australia, you can find it in a few bookshops here. 
um, this uh, uh, Christian bookshop called Kurong. You can find it in Kurong. You can also find it on my website, uh, www.destinedtolive.com.au. Um, those who are in Rwanda or Africa, you can also find it um, on the Genesa, at the Genesa Memorial Bookshop. And you can also find it in the Made, Made in Rwanda at um, BK Arena. Uh, so you can find it, you know, you can, you can order a copy either way, online mm -hmm. or in person. If somebody wants to connect with you, do you have um, outside of your website, um, destinedtolive.com.au, do you have social media sites or YouTube channel that people can connect with you and subscribe to? Yes. Yes, I've got a, I've got a, a Instagram and also um, I've got web, Facebook as well. You can search me under my name, um, Frida Umuhoza, uh, and my Instagram is Umuhoza94. Um, you can connect me with uh, on there as well as Twitter. It's Umuhoza94 as well. You can follow me on Twitter um, and, yeah, connect from there. Okay, okay, very well. Well, thank you so much, Frida, for sharing your testimony. It was really a joy, and I really appreciate you, your sacrifice of um, waking up this early, but most important for being very vulnerable and then encouraging. Um, I believe a lot of people are going to be impacted, and I believe this testimony will go even further to um, just reach more people about the power of forgiveness and the power of Jesus, and um, really thank you for, uh, for doing that. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Guys, um, if this was a blessing to you, um, let me know in the comments right now. Um, ah, this was this was powerful. This was incredible, um, in, incredible. So drop that number one in the chat if um, you were moved and blessed by this powerful, powerful testimony. Um, guys, I want to do something uh, before we go any further, before I let you go. Um, <coughs> Uh, somebody said nice smile can tell that she suffered yeah um, it was it was incredible it was incredible um, incredible testimony share this with other people um, I believe that it's going to impact a lot of a lot of people's lives share this with your small group um, and uh, I believe it's going to be very 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 powerful so um, somebody was asking uh, that the book is $17 it's $20 so let me actually give you the new link guys um, let me update the link right now. It's on Amazon for seventeen dollars, um, large print. So just fo just follow that one. We're gonna update it on the website as well. There is one link where it's like ninety dollars because sometimes there's like a very rare print of a particular book um, and stuff. So, but this one is. Um, is 17 so if you click on the book and see all formats and editions you'll be able to see um, that it's um, uh, that the book is um, is 17 okay we're gonna update it guys if this was a blessing to you would you help and support um, the ministry would you sow into this testimony as well um, we will help to bless Frida as well we want to send everything that's going to come in today um, through this stream uh, to bless her family to bless her ministry and for her to reach more people so um, as you um, give today through the website and as you give today through cash app or through Venmo just put you know um, forgiveness testimony or Frida's testimony and then we will making making sure that we pass everything on tomorrow to her uh, we just want to bless her so if this was a blessing to you consider um, being a blessing the Bible says to be generous with our resources for those of you who are able to give if you cannot give that's completely fine we appreciate you staying with us and watching this broadcast if God puts in your heart to partner with our ministry guys this will be very much appreciated we release books courses um, podcasts and so much content every single day that touches the world and so um, yeah, and even bring guests like these um, for you guys. So if this was a blessing to you, consider becoming a partner. This will help us to reach more people. I um, want to remind you again that I'm going to be in Massachusetts, Springfield, Massachusetts this Friday. And then um, in a few weeks, I'm going to be in Houston. And then we're going to have a pastor's conference. So make sure that you check those out and come and visit us. We would love to see you on those. Guys, appreciate you all. I will see you next week. Um, I got to run and um, hope everybody's doing good. So stay strong um, and I will see you again uh, very soon. Blessings to you.